So there's an expression in Hebrew, I don't know, it's Gomrim uh, I don't know how to translate it to English. It's from the uh, Hebrew military. You know, we, we get a job done, we get to go home. So, uh, so uh, we can might as well start. Um, okay, so, so we, we, as I uh, wrote an email that maybe some of you got, so, so this panel started like, uh, the idea for this panel, in fact, should have been, should have been there from the start, but you know, as disorganized as we are, we, we kind of started uh, uh, like maybe last week, uh, uh, trying to see how we're going to get an opening talk to this uh, workshop. Somebody going to give some overview uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of of the field, and then we asked Amal, "Will you, can you do it in the last minute?" And she said, first she said, "Yes, great, yeah, I'll do it." And then a couple of days later, hmm, maybe you know. And then we started having this discussion by email, uh, 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 you know, what are the topics and stuff. And then we realized, okay, in fact, this is a discussion that everybody should be part of. And so, okay, why don't we make it a panel? And then we started, you know, when we're going to make the panel, so let's just do it in the end. And uh, uh, we kind of thought that we'll be maybe the only ones left at the end, but there are still a couple of brave ones left, so uh, that's great. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, so, so it's the four of us giving our, our, like, we'll start maybe with just brief uh, uh, ideas of what we uh, have in mind, the things that we thought of, and, uh, um, and then we'll just uh, open it up for, for discussion. I think it should be like an interactive thing. Um, so, so here's kind of like uh, three, two and a half slides about uh, kind of high level stuff of uh, um, where we are. Uh, my kind of personal uh, and biased and not objective view of where we are. So, so in, in, in essence, cryptographic uh, program analysis, or protocol analysis, is a special case of, program, of, 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 of programming language analysis. In the sense that we are trying to prove properties of programs uh, pro or protocols, which are distributed programs, and we want to do static analysis, right? We want to look at code and see what the code does and say, make statements about what the code does. So of course, it, can, it doesn't need to be just code, it can be also hardware and, and, and other parts of computing elements, but essentially programs, right? Uh, and in particular, what you want to do is, is uh, to prove uh, 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 correctness, proper, correctness pro, uh, um, properties, lightness properties, and some sort of information flow properties in sense of like how information flows through the, 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 the programs and the computation, you know, where it does go, where it doesn't go, and uh, different uh, type of things. Uh, things like that. Uh, uh, but it is a very uh, specific special case, right? So, so the properties are inherently probabilistic. Even to talk about privacy, secrecy, in the shaman sense, you have to talk about randomness. Uh, uh, and the solutions are inherently randomized uh, as, as, as a consequence. Uh, so this, uh, you know, so we have to be able to talk about probabilities in programs. Um, and the systems are distributed, and we typically want to talk about adversarially controlled uh, uh, scheduling and, and control of the distributed system, um, and in, in certain forms of, uh, you know, more or less uh, limited, restricted. That means that, that already here, the modeling becomes very delicate, uh, uh, and we need to make the right probabilistic statements, how to make it, and this is already by itself, it's, it's, it's a very delicate issue. Uh, and then on top of it, be uh, most of the thing, most of the properties we can prove on non-normal protocols are uh, only for potentially bounded adversaries. And furthermore, we can only do it by reduction to hard to other the other you know hard problems. So it makes the, the the modeling much more delicate, and the proofs are uh, pretty stylized because essentially this is what we know how to do. Uh, and, and on top of everything, kind of disappears everywhere. But uh, the, 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 the security preserving composition is become is really tricky. I mean, you really want to have a security of a big system. You want to do it uh, in a modular way or uh, uh, um, in any way that you want to do it. To to be able to deduce about uh, uh, security of bigger systems, small one is, is tricky. Um, but the, so but this is the special case we're talking about, and. Um, so just, uh, again, a biased uh, brief history of time. So, so if you think about the crypto world, how the notions of security kind of evolved from the 80s. So we started with the notion of semantic security, so randomness, kind of like the, uh, uh, the, the very basics of how we can actually mathematically talk about security. Then we had those simple the initial game-based definitions. Uh, and then we had the simulation paradigm that evolved. Uh, and then uh, kind of like a slightly separated 
simulation based from real ideal because, well, they kind of tied together but not completely. So we have uh, the real ideal paradigm in the context of MPC or more generally encrypted protocols. And then we talk about composition, particular universal composition, which kind of this general way of talk about composition. Then we can have more modern uh, style definitions like a game-based definitions we see with simulations, which are in some sense, you can think of them as variants of, 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 of UC uh, uh, definitions in for specific settings. You know, joint state compositions, are things that are more uh, delicate, but this is where we are in crypto modeling. Um, and in, in the uh, kind of this PL-based security modeling. So, so there, there's, of course, a lot of work done on modeling concurrency and uh, this notion of refinement, which actually is, is a very, maybe uh, Amal will say more about it, but it is in some sense kind of like the, the, the moral equivalence of universal composition, you know, of taking a module and replacing with another module having the same effect. Uh, um, and, uh, and then there were a lot of work was done on uh, uh, um, PL-based modeling of security. So maybe the first most famous one is this the Levia model where all the cryptographic uh, 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 bo um, components are kind of ideal boxes and you can uh, prove the stuff on them and then what does it mean in real life? Um, uh, and then there is a, a modeling again of concurrency um, with the pi, pi calculus and by simulation, which is again uh, kind of a moral equivalent of uh, uh, of uh, uh, emulation with some uh, caveats. Uh, and then we have the spike calculus, which is didn't write again about uh, security properties. And then the people started uh, combining those uh, those two worlds. The body Rogway showing like a computationally sound ideal cryptography, and then Michal Chovarinsky and other works that uh, built on that. But in those works, still there was this separate worlds. There was a computational world, and there was a divide. And then you kind of realize in a deal world and the rest of the analysis is a deal. Um, and uh, then we, we, we advanced further and we, we, we started having those programming language style uh, analysis of, uh, of, of proofs by reduction, the actual cryptographic proofs that you know, cryptographers do every day. Uh, uh, and I uh, start with game-based proof, which is kind of an easier thing to model. We have CryptoVerif, we have uh, EasyCrypt, we have FCF, we have uh, other, other systems today. Uh, and then uh, our next step was to, to, to kind of start doing the same thing, but not for game-based uh, definitions, but simulation-based definitions with simulator, ideal, and real model. And, and the UC proof, you've seen the talk of, uh, of Ali yesterday. Uh, um, and and, and see, things seem to be kind of like coming together in a good way, I think. Uh, and let me just let me try to be audacious, but say maybe you know UC security and PL stuff fruit. Maybe it's a, it's a match made in heaven in the sense that this is a way to to get the best of everything. So you can have so since even mechanized proofs have problem with the scale, right? So you want to do it modularly even with with mechanized proofs. So this way you can maybe get it all. He get uh, meaningful and expressive properties with with cryptographic soundness. And, and problem, problem, PL soundness, you know, no, you know, no bugs and proofs and implementation. And you can have different layers of analysis kind of talk together, hopefully one day. So all the way down from the design uh, to the protocol, to the primitives, to, to the implementation of the primitives, to the hardware the deployments and everything, you know, and, and all kind of all those analyses talk, talk together, talk to each other. Um, and do it for real style, you know, production style protocols. So that's uh, hopefully that's uh, hopefully the goal. Anyway, so that's that's most my spiel. So I think Amal has some. So we can t we can ask me about this, so we can you can do your talk, and I know what which order you want to do. Uh, that's one of the things I was hoping we could talk about, uh, and I could give you a little bit of a sense of um, how we think about compiler correctness and compiler verification and security preserving compilation in the PL setting, and then perhaps try to ask you, like, you know, from crypto um, perspective, if we talk about different layers of analysis and sort of getting end to end proofs of an entire software stack, um, what does that look like? What are the properties we're interested in verifying? Like, that's one topic of discussion that uh, I was hoping that we could have. So, uh, up to you. Should should we? Okay. So let's, let's let Amal present her slides, and then we can all sit down in front and, and, and sort of back and forth. Sure. Okay. Possible.
Yeah, absolutely. And also, yeah. we'd really like to make this a conversation, not just us talking, because the point is, you know, we want to know what people's thoughts are about all of, all of these uh, topics. So if anyone wants to say something right now pertaining to that, you know, that's, yeah, Muthu. I, I just have like a very brief question. Um, just for the, the, you know, the, what I would consider the simplest protocol in the passive setting is like BGW, let's say, you know, three-party BGW. Has that been any analysis for this, like in the formal space that uh, we know of? Passive, like one should not even worry about probabilities in this case. Has that been something done in the formal regime to? Uh, well, what do BGW you want? is a probabilistic protocol, right? But, uh, but, but has okay. perfect security. Maybe it's possible to like uh, factor that out. I don't so, know. So, so I think uh, what you were talking about today, yeah. earlier today, was sounded like something along these lines, right? What was your question? Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to think about probabilities in distinguishability, but all that person is yes. Like when I think of perfect security, passive setting, formal proofs must be much more simpler. Hopefully, I don't know as a starting point. But you still reason about like output distributions and not. It's perfectly secure. Then again, the distributions are identical. So would it become easier? Like shouldn't a formal proof be much more easier than? Arguing indistinguishability, polynomial time adversity, so you might want to think about that, but just argue perfect security. It's just a different kind of argument. I mean, you still argue about distributions, you don't have to do security reduction. So, in that sense, it gets easier, yes. Even, even a one time pad um, requires a way of working with the random choice that uses uh, an isomorphism on, on the space of bit strings, say. Um, so I think it's the case that, that a purely symbolic checker like the Stolo Yao, Yao um, system isn't going to be able to handle that. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that it would, but, but, but a tool like EasyCrypt or, you know, or CryptoVerif or FCF, um, has a way of, of dealing with this kind of thing that in you know even even with information theoretic security I think we need something more than just symbolic. Okay, since we're already talking about this topic, I thought I'd just race ahead because I had it last in my slide deck. But yeah, so the question is, there are, you know, these various tools for verifying, you know, for doing machine check proofs of uh, crypto protocols and, uh, uh, you know, what's sort of missing in this space. And, and beyond that, then there's this sort of other issue of beyond verifying protocols. Um, what, what are the problems that need to be solved to get an end-to-end -end security guarantee about implementations of protocols? So this is along the lines of what Manuel was talking about in, in his talk yesterday. Um, are there gaps? Are there things that we take for granted that you know are problems that we should be addressing? So. Is Manuel here? Uh, he had to go. You had to go. Oh, that's that's a shame. Can I just say something about gaps while we're on that that subject? That um, there's a there's a way of thinking like in in the deep spec community and program in the programming language area. Um, that everything needs to be within a single proof assistant, so there's this common currency. And um, the problem is that we have some specialized tools that are good for different kinds of things. And um, so EasyCrypt um, is, is good for doing these relational proofs, um, uh, computational model proofs, but um, Coq is good for doing proofs about um, compilation, refinement from some high-level specification eventually to uh, machine code. And there's this question, how do you put them together? Um, and I think we don't, there, there, is, there is work in, in the PL and logic community about this topic, it's not something I know a lot about, but, but we need to somehow crack it because 
it's not okay, I think, to say everything has to be done in a single system. I think that's limiting. Um, it's also um, frustrating to do the kind of thing that Manuel and his colleagues have done in these works where they do a proof at one level and then they do a proof at another level and then they hand wave about um, the, the glue between the two. And it's, it's I mean, it's not, it's not wrong, um, but it's potentially, it, it's, it could be could be wrong. It could be that the assumptions are somehow um, inconsistent, that the, the, this gap, I mean, they, there's some papers, mind the gap, and you know, the, the gap is, is potentially something you can get your foot stuck in um, as you're trying to get onto the train. So, so let's talk precisely about what these gaps are, right? So there's, um, there are proofs at different levels. When you say levels, you mean different, um, like in the sense of a compiler, as we're translating down to a lower level in, in Manuel's work, for instance. Um, so, so that kind of thing is something that, you know, um, the PL community has been working on compiler verification, compiler correctness for a while. How do we start to think about, um, you know, going from uh, a proof of a protocol verified at, you know, just at the level of this is my protocol and I need to specify it somehow, to now implementing that protocol in something like EasyCrypt using EasyCrypt's wild language. Right, and then going from that very simple implementation to actually, you know, how do I actually how, turn this implementation of a protocol into the actual code for the protocol that runs at the end of the day on the machine, right? How do I take the the proof of perhaps UC or or for this protocol and preserve it all the way down through different stages of the compiler? Um, and, and something interesting that comes up if we start to ask this question, or at least I've been asking it for, from, you know, to various people over the last, uh, since yesterday, um, is what happens to our attacker model? So if we go back to, to UC, right, you have this idea of there's an ideal functionality, there is a real um, imp of implementation in some sense for that functionality, um, and we want to prove that for all possible adversaries, there's a simulator that, uh, such that the environment can't tell the difference between ideal interacting with the simulator and the real interacting with the adversary, right? So now, how do we, um, to me, as a PL person, this is an equivalence proof. It is an equivalence between um, the real and the ideal, all right? And I think most of the people in this room are crypto people. Would you, I, I have a slide on how PL people think about equivalence proofs in a single language, just the statement. Would you like to see that? Yes? OK, great. Um, let me go back. We have a diff few different, so this was my question, yes. Um, relationship between UC and contextual equivalence in PL. OK, so in PL, if you have a single language, single programming language, um, then, and, and imagine that E1 and E2 are expressions, uh, uh, any program expressions that I can write in that language. But these are not whole programs. Um, think of them as program components. Then we say that E1 and E2 are equivalent, um, contextually equivalent is the term used for it, um, if they exhibit the same behavior, observable behavior when placed in any legitimate program context. So there's always this idea of um, there is a context, this, this gray oval over here. That is what I need. That's the rest of the program such that when I have it, I will have a complete program that I can run. And then you basically say that for all possible contexts, which is that gray oval, um, if I stick E1 into that hole in my context um, and, and run it, then I should see the same observable behavior as if I stick E2 into that context. This is the standard notion of contextual equivalence that's been around forever. What is it? Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really good question. And my slide oversimplifies this. So here I wrote it as if you run E1 with the, in, the pro, you know, in the context, then you get a value V. Um, then you get the same value V as if you run um, the, the whole program with E2 and stuck in that hole. Um, so an observable can be different things depending on your language. And um, in a language in which all programs terminate, you say, uh, when I run the program, I will get the same answer, the same value out at the end. And usually we restrict it so that we say integer values or some kind of value that we can actually test equality on. So not functions, for instance. Um, uh, and uh, if it's uh, some sort of a language in which you produce observable traces, like you know, you're printing uh, to the screen or to a file or modifying memory, then you know, your observables, modifying memory sometimes is not taken as externally observable, but sometimes you could. Um, but so you know, there's, there's some, um, 
room here in what is observable behavior. You have to sort of decide that a priori, and then the definition basically says you say the same observable behavior when you run that program as when you run that program. So literally, it could be I.O. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in, in process algebra and sort of um, it, it can be something much more complicated. So, so it, it, it could be the, the observable behavior of a whole system could be something that's very complicated or it could be something that's very simple. Yes. In crypto, typically the, the guarantees are probabilistic. So what if this great program, um, I mean, this is how I define security definitions when I teach crypto. Uh -huh. I say that any, for any gray program, it will have the same uh, output distribution, whether it's got E1 or E2 inside of this hole. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's that exactly that how, thing? in fact, that's exactly how I would take that notion of observable for this setting, for the probabilistic setting, and change it to distributions. That, that you know, you want to see the same distribution when you run the first program as when you see the second. Now that is a huge point. So in, in PL, if um, in PL there are different, this property contextual equivalence is very difficult to prove in PL in general. Um, it's very easy to prove in the following simple setting. When the interactions between the gray part and the, th the whole are, are simply a matter of passing things like integers and strings across that boundary, then this is, you know, contextual equivalence properties can be quite easy to reason about. But um, often, uh, you know, for like uh, high level languages, we, we think about um, computations flowing across, or at least pointers to computations to code flowing across, right? So you might have the gray part pass a function to my E1 uh, and let it run it. Uh, then it gets more difficult because then you have to reason about, um, you effectively have to say the gray part is passing some sort of co uh, computation into the E1 and how will it use it? So then you get into this issue of what makes functions equivalent and functions are equivalent if given related inputs, they give you related outputs. So it's, uh, it's, it's a harder problem. And that is actually another thing for crypto. So if you think about UC, and if you think about interactions between um, the, the real and the adversary, um, it seems to me, I mean, they're always, they're, they're sort of at the level of base types, right? They're at the level of uh, integers um, in that sense. It's a simpler setting, right? You're not passing computations between that interaction, if I'm, if I'm right. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Of course, I mean, those strings can be anything. They can be anything, okay. So, so then that's a fundamental question for me at least. Um, as a community, given this problem, um, it, let's say we wanted to do something like UC preserving compilation, whatever that is, however we define it. Um, should we worry about computations flowing across that? Yeah, uh, we, we well, should. Um, yes. Uh, so yeah, in uh, compiler verification in general, it's never about computationally bounded. That's the part of the gap, right? Um, it's always about, um, but there are techniques for limiting what your context can do. So you can you can say, for instance, I will only link with well-typed contexts. And by being well-typed, you're ruling out certain classes of bad behavior. So that means you're uh, linking with attackers which are better behaved, in a sense. And you can use these types or specifications to say, I will only link with something that satisfies this spec, and somehow you want to tighten that spec enough so that the attacker doesn't behave badly. That's the trick. Sabine, you had a. I have a couple more on what's going on with this idea of equivalence when it comes to not just a single language, but compiling, all right, which I think is pertinent to this discussion. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I assume part of program equivalence is that you can then choose which of these items to use, right, as a, as a compiler. Yeah. Um, so, I haven't. So, here, think of this as. 
For now, I'm showing you a single language definition, right? So usually when we think about the single language contextual equivalence, we're saying, let's say you had a stack interface and you had two different implementations, E1 and E2. One uses, um, uh, represents the stack as a linked list, the other one represents the stack as an array. Yep. This is the kind of thing I would use to prove to someone that, oh, I can just swap out one implementation with the other and the rest of the world, all the clients will not know the difference. So, but if I have an optimizing compiler, I could yes. be like, oh, the right thing to use is E1 mm -hmm. for this setting. Yes. And so you not only need to argue about equivalence, you need to understand like resource utilization. Ah. Of these um, two. So in the compiler correctness community, we are not very far along in terms of showing that um, one, uh, that E1 is somehow more optimal than E2. There are some techniques for doing that. Um, they they obviously require accounting for cost and so on. But yeah, there are, there are languages and type systems for doing that. People haven't started talking about them in a compilation context yet. Yeah. So, so actually I'd like, to show you, I'd like to show you just a couple more slides because the, the ones that come up now are about compilation, whereas the first one was really in my mind about the source language itself. Okay, so, um, I want to sort of categorize what's happening in the compiler verification world. Um, so the simplest possible thing that, um, even that is not simple, uh, that people have proved in compiler verification is compiler correctness under the assumption that when you have a source program PS and you compile it to a target program PT, I'm going to assume that, no, that PT never gets linked with any other target code. Okay, under that assumption, I can prove to you that PS and PT are equivalent. And what does it mean for them to be equivalent? Roughly, it means that if you run PS and you see some observable behaviors, then if you run PT, PT will, you will see the same observable behaviors. This is the, the way that, uh, this is the kind of compiler correctness um, proof, this is whole program semantics preservation, that the CompSearch C compiler proved um, until very, very recently when it, it, it's been, Yes. Um, they do very different things. And the whole trick here then becomes, um, essentially how this proof is set up is you say, okay, I have the source program and I'm running it, right? Uh, I wanna show that there, that somehow simulates the behavior of the target program running. So the way the proof is done is you say, um, well, first let me say observables. Observables could be, um, f uh, you know, e uh, external function calls or um, input output. So genuinely, you know, yeah, I/O kinds of behavior that you can observe from the outside, um, and then the way you do the proof is you you actually come up with a relation between source and target. So, for example, if I have five in the source, I might want to relate it to one zero one in the target, just to give you a trivial example. Uh, so, but you have to do this over then a relationship between the memories, uh, so so to speak, of the source program and of the target program. You set up a relation. You show that initially the relation holds, and then you say no matter how many steps I took my source took and my target took, if I'm right here and the relation holds, then if the source takes one step, then the target takes one or more steps and things relate again using the same relation. So you come up with this relation to say how memories and program states, so to speak, in the source are related to these low level program states in the target. And then you show that that relation is preserved as the two programs run. It's a simulation argument. Um, and, and so this is easy to do, um, easier to do in, if you're assuming a whole program. It becomes much harder if you assume, um, if you try to prove a stronger theorem about compiler correctness, which is that um, I'm, I am going to allow my target code to link with other things. So just to say what that looks like, um, this is one variation, it's not even the best one. Um, basically now I've written E because I want you to think of components, not whole programs. If I have a source component compiled to a target, I roughly want to show something like if, um, if you give me any, uh, so basically I want, to, I want to link that target code with some context to make it a whole program. Okay, so now we're back to trying to use contextual equivalence in, in a sort of way. Um, so we say that if you have a target context that you want to link the target code with, then if you also have a source co context um, that's equivalent to that somehow, uh, so if CS and CT are equivalent, then I, that whole program, when run, uh, its behavior matches the behavior of this target program, right? In essence. Of course, this is, yes, I see a hand going up. This is difficult because how, how do you know, how do you specify when CS and CT are related? Yeah. So is that a relaxation of the previous notion? Because you say that 
They don't have to always be equivalent, but only within the contexts. Ah, so this is saying for all possible contexts, CT, such that you have a related source context, CS. When you run the whole programs, they have to be related. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think of this, uh, this is a generalization of the, the last one. It, it could be empty, in which case you get the last, uh, the, the theorem on the last slide. But if your context is not empty, then you're doing something more powerful. You're saying, yes, I, I can handle linking. My compiler correctness theorem um, is, you know, aware that uh, this is how the compiler will be used in some sense. So Yes. Uh -huh. Exactly. So I don't know. I don't care how it's implemented as long as there's some CS that has the functionality of string compare. Then composing this and composing that gives us the same behavior when run. You see compositionality. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, this also has some issues because. Um, it, it assumes that anything that you're doing at the target must be representable or equivalent to something at the source. So there are all sorts of other issues then if you want to consider linking with code that could not be represented in your source language, but that's a PL problem maybe. <laughs> Might not arise. Um, this is hard to specify. It's not clear uh, how to, uh, it's, it's again a sort of chicken and egg kind of problem. Um, there are, Normally, we don't specify that equivalence directly for contexts. We do it using a different technique called logical relations, which is just a, a way of proving that things are equivalent. Um, yeah. It goes back to that issue of, you know, how do you compare two functions that are equivalent? Well, if you give me two related inputs, then I get two related outputs, et cetera. Okay, so then there's this stronger property even, security preserving compilation or equivalence preserving compilation. And I wonder if this is UC to be honest, um, which is part of why I wanted to show this. So now if you have two source components, ES1 and ES2, and they're indistinguishable by some attacker, let's say, by some context in the source. Okay, so I compile them then. Context is the gray guy. Exactly. So if I have ES1 and ES2, they were indistinguishable by the gray thing in the source language. Gray things that can be written only in the source language, because we care about which language. Um, then after I've compiled them to ET1 and ET2, then they're indistinguishable by all possible contexts in the target. And now this is generally in PL, it's much harder to prove because at the target level you have an assembly language. And in an assembly language, Attackers you can write in the assembly language or program context you can write in the assembly language can do a lot more things, things that are not possible in a source language. You know, like in assembly you can jump anywhere and disrupt control flow, things that you cannot do in a, in a well-behaved source language. So do we want, when we say UC preserving, one way of perhaps looking at that is to say, if I know that ideal and the ideal and real functionalities are equivalent at the source level, then uh, when I compile, I still want, I want to know that the compiled real functionality is somehow equivalent to what? To the compiled ideal functionality? I'm not... That's, this doesn't strike me. This is really interesting. Okay. See, the, the environment, we always talk about the right ways. We always talk about the worst possible... Uh, uh, yes. The most powerful distinguisher. distinguisher. So you always talk about the red context. So, the... That's not what. Okay. Well, I sort of have one other question. Maybe this is primarily a question for Ron, but because it's about UC. So the the assumption the assumption about the yes <laughs> the assumption about the attacker in UC. Um, when you write your um, real protocol um, at such a high level of abstraction, from me, from a PL perspective, it's, it's still in a high level source language, the wild language in EasyCrypt, for instance. You're, I guess you, you talk about your attacker as, you know, this is a polynomial time, et cetera. Um, I've been wondering if the powers of the attacker go up when we are in a low level language. Have you thought about that? Is there, or is there? Yeah. 
whereas we mostly talk about uh, you know programmatic attacks like sending messages or reordering messages. Okay, so then as we compile, we want to take uh, additional attacks into account, which means that if we want to to take protocols verified at the source level and run their implement their compiled implementations eventually, we should be taking these additional no, or or no. I think it's still a sufficient goal just to just to have like a a way of taking a high level specification and mm -hmm. being certain that at least the low level thing is is uh, equivalent and therefore uh, immune to all of those you know programmatic level attacks. I don't think you have to get the whole system sync. And oh, sure, sure, attacks. sure. But but I was wondering, do you think that there are vulnerabilities <laughs> no, no, so, in the long term? <laughs> so, 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 so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First, the, there's an issue here. There's, it's a fundamental issue with uh, uh, the UC modeling, but it's actually more like the way it's used today. Uh, uh, and this is the way that there really is a big discrepancy here between the, the UC is written like in a very low level language, kind of Turing machines or whatever other machines you want to say. It's not even written in a, you know, in a, in a, in a PL formal enough language written in English, in broken English. But, and, and, uh, a major yeah. part of the gap. <laughs> exactly. And in, in, even if one did uh, write a, a completely formal PL style uh, modeling of the way that you see the base written now, you know, my work and other people's work that have different variants of this, it is very, very low level and uh, kind of like assembly style level. And then the programs are written in some high level language and, uh, and then there is some hand waving going on, so it's okay. And, uh, and there's a lot of issues there, right? Uh, uh, so, so what are they? I, I, I actually, I want the... No, but, nice so, so we never know. So we always believe that our proofs are like essentially okay. We just need to fill out details, and you maybe 90% of the time it's good, it's okay. Sometimes it's not. But really, if one wanted to do this uh, thing, like uh, really, one would have to actually specify uh, a programming language and, and actually write the ideal functionalities and the protocols in the programming language proof. And this is one thing that Ali did. That in, in for this very simple uh, thing in this, and this programming language of EasyCrypt, which is doesn't even have a compiler, but never mind. At least it's a programming language, and uh, uh, and this is maybe a first uh, start. And and so so one really needs to do that. And uh, and actually that I want to slightly take back what I said earlier about the you know the blue and the red. So so I think actually the UC doesn't have UC modeling does have an equivalent for that, which is this notion of ideal functionalities that uh, give you kind of like a real, uh, an abstraction of reality. So, so there's this ideal functionality that give you secure communication or you know, authenticated communication. So this kind of restricts in some sense the environment of the attacker, the gray area from specific attacks because the, the parties know that in the design of the protocol they have uh, 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 you know, ideal authenticated communication. Or you can say one, one specific type of abstraction is saying that you know, the way you write the, 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 the code of the protocol, you write, uh, uh, um, write the code such that in a single uh, uh, run of, uh, in a single activation of your, of your program, you do that, that many pieces of, of code, and then nobody can measure how much time it really took, because in the model it's one, it's one, one kind of quantum of execution. And that's already, by the way you work this way, you can say there is no timing attack of what's happening inside because nobody measures. And if you wanted to actually uh, allow the adversary you know, access to that, you would have to do something, either you know, a, a leak to the adversary something about the number of steps, or maybe write uh, the, 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 uh, the, the atomic step is something smaller, or something, you have to actually model it. So there is a way in the UC to actually make, uh, uh, to, to kind of like tie the hands of, of the environment from say to blue to the red. It's not as uh, 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 explicit, but it's there. Maybe it's a good thing to make it explicit. Yeah, yeah. So actually, that's that's kind of what I wanted to say. How do we make it explicit? Um, well, I, I left it at that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, context. The, this kind of contextual equivalence um, is uh, so is symmetric, right? I mean, that's that's one of the things. It's transitive, it's reflexive, it's symmetric, it's an equivalence, and it works in context. And if we think about UC, then there's transitivity and there's reflexivity, but there is certainly not symmetry, right? It doesn't, doesn't even make sense to so, talk. So 
So this, um, in, we can we can always do contextual approximations, but the less right. Less, less but less but less. I don't I don't I don't think that that's the issue. That I mean the issue is that there is a, a fundamental asymmetry that on the left side you have real plus adversary, on the right side you have ideal plus simulator wrapped around adversary, and and um, the. Um, so that's that's one thing that that you you can't just flip it around. It it doesn't it doesn't make sense in that direction. The other thing is that what the context in PL terms um, has like two different analogs in UC. That that the environment is a kind of context because it's supplying inputs to the functionality and consuming their outputs. The kind of the kind of normal API. Um, is flowing back and forth that way. And so, which contexts, right, are like that as well in, in like a functional language, even in PL. Um, but the adversary um, is a different kind of context. It's, it's observing um, sort of um, other behavior that, that the like network traffic um, of, of the, the, the parties of the real functionality. Um, there's also this issue of um, of it being able to corrupt certain parts of the real functionality that you know that are marked as corruptible, um, which you know I, that's that's another dimension to this. But even if we don't think about that, um, there are like these two different aspects of the context that have these two different um, places within UC, and I mean, so that that's something I think. I mean, I really feel. Like there's something fundamentally different, and and I feel like in the PL community that we should try to figure out what to do with this more more generally. And and if I can, I mean, sorry, uh, can I just talk for a couple more minutes? Um, that um, that I came, you know, I came from PL to um, to Lincoln Lab and found myself doing stuff with EasyCrypt and learning about the real ideal paradigm. And I thought, oh wow, this is this is really really different from anything I'd ever seen before. And I ended up writing, among other things, a paper with some some colleagues about um, how to think about the security of Battleship um, in a in a totally programming language context. There was no crypto as we were doing this. All the enforcement was by programming language mechanisms. Um, but I found, um, I mean, we we had some implementations using like information flow languages that some interns had written, and and when I thought, well, what does it mean to be secure, right? What does it mean to be secure for one one player to be secure against another one that might be bad, you know, in in their interactions? Um, when I started out, I thought, well, I, I have no idea. And in the end, I, I, I realized, well, it, real ideal was the way to think about this. Because um, what happens in Battleship is that information is really slowly re uh, revealed to you um, over time. Um, but in the end, you learn everything. And, um, and you can give a real, an ideal functionality um, for that. Um, so that when you think about how you might want to implement it, um, you might use a, a programming language that has information flow control or some other technique, but at least you, you have a definition that you're trying to match. And um, I think within PA, the PL security, the language-based security community, I, I've been trying to make the point that often there is no definition you know, that people are trying to, to prove what does security mean, no one knows that you know they they know it when they see it. Um, and the great thing that that PL that, that crypto um, has come up with with real ideal is a way of saying that and separating that from an actual implementation. So so I think I think that's you know that there's something actually new and 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 things like, you know, how does this manifest itself more generally within programming languages? I'm not sure that, you know, it's we, we can we can make sense of it in terms of security, but I want to say that there's gotta be some some reading of all of this that's broader than that. The, well, the question that I had was uh, kind of in response to Amal's question, 
so why not try to see uh, we have ideal, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, ideal and real, and then you say we want to compile the real implementation into a lower level, so why not to put it to the left, the implementation level, put it to the left of the real one and call the real now the, the new ideal and the implementation the new real. Right, so implement, uh, sorry. You can have a chain as long as you wish. Yes, so let's do this maybe downwards. So there's uh, ideal at the top, the real implements it or is emulates it, and then the compiled version of uh, the real uh, emulates the original version of the real, right? As a stack, yes. This was another way I was trying to depict it to someone yesterday. Um, and But I, I, I still don't really know what, ex maybe that is the correct theorem that we want. I've been sort of asking this question of- And you could use the same what do we? the same definition. Yes, the yes, same absolutely. Same uh, that, that would apply, professor. yeah. So it's a question of what theorem are we looking for in, in terms of how we use these protocols at the end of the day, the compiled versions, um, that's like, that's what I wanted to do with this discussion. Like, you know, can we start thinking sure about those? When you, have, when you compose these layers, yes. then uh, you, you don't violate any uh, surprising composability. Exactly, issues. exactly, yep. I have a question. In general, I mean, when we talk about crypto simulation security, it offers both correctness and privacy. Now. Let's leave privacy for a minute and just ask about correctness. The program that I'm writing, is it indeed sorting numbers or is it computing FFT or something? Mm -hmm. Now, how does one prove this, let's say in the PL world, saying some piece of code actually does the computation that I care about? Because simulation gives both. Mm -hmm. it, it both tells that the protocol <coughs> I'm emulating does compute the intended functionality as well as you know, uh, privacy, and I'm asking just in terms just of the correctness, correctness property. property. So, so you write down a specification for what you, uh, you know, for, for what functionality you want, the, the full functional spec, so to speak, and then you show that the thing that you have implemented actually satisfies that specification, and you can do this in, a, in COC, for instance, and that's what people have been doing uh, for a, a while now uh, with all the verified software that they're building. Say maybe it's a that, so just that, uh, to, you know, I think the Ali's point in your view, you know, like you know, there's one way to, to uh, kind of merge them. So so maybe what we're doing crypto, but the ideal uh, real paradigm is that, you know, the specification is by itself a program. And and and, the, and and it's a program that nobody ever wants to run. Nobody thinks of running. Just a convenient way, maybe a uh, conceptually convenient way to run the specification, which combines security and you know secrecy, correctness, etc. Because we're talking about distributed thing, there's this trusted party, whatever we all know. So 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 it's a program for a trusted party, and uh, this is our specification. And from now on, well, first it's conceptually convenient because we know what we want, even a distributed system. And then from now on, I mean, we can just uh, deploy the same techniques, right? And then uh, this is this refinement of compilation techniques. And so there's one, yeah. thing. There's one Except thing. that this first program is something we never want to actually run. Yes. Never so actually run. This yeah. happens in concurrency. In the, in, so in PL, when we verify um, like fine-grained concurrent data structures, um, how do we do it? We write down uh, a specification for it, but the specification is just a sequential program. It's just a simple way of writing a program that says, yes, you know, this is, this is what I want at the end of the day. It's the sequential program that implements that. So we view that as a spec, exactly like you're, you're saying. Yeah. But, but then uh, Andrew yesterday was not very happy with it. He said, there, you know, that thing is not, you know what yeah. thing is. But this is a different question. That's, that you put things on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just had a, a confusion or a question about what Ali was saying. So you were making a distinction between uh, the environment choosing the inputs and consuming the outputs and, and then the adversary uh, doing whatever it does uh, to, the, to the participants. Um, but I guess I would argue that it's, it, the environment and the adversary are the same thing and it's all one interface and that interface is always well defined as the functionality. So whether it's the environment choosing the inputs or the adversary, you know, talking to the functionality or or taking control over a party. It's all arbitrary behavior that this this uh, context can do, um, and I don't think that just like I didn't understand the distinction between those two. And actually, I would argue that the the thing that makes this complicated is that we want to prove a statement that says there exists a simulator. I think once you have the simulator, you're just talking about 
some contextual equivalence of, of two programs. It's the composition of all these things in the real world and the composition of some other things in the ideal world. And they, they should be equivalent in an arbitrary context. context. The context can be a composition of the, the simulator and the environment. Well, the, the, compo the two composed programs are equivalent. And one of the composed programs contains a simulator. If you're starting out and you don't have the simulator, then asking EasyCrypt to find the simulator is, is challenging. But I would, I would suspect that once the human cryptographer wrote down the simulator, then you just have like two well-defined programs that need to be contextually equivalent in, in, in arbitrary context. Well, yeah, I'm not. I mean, I, I, I tried to say that I thought that the environment and the adversary were two different aspects of what we might think of as the context, and, but they have, they have different roles, right? One of them is, is about input-output behavior, and the other is about other things that can be observed. Um, so like network traffic or um, other kind of side effects and things. Um, and the way that the simulator fits into this, um, this real ideal pair of games just seems quite, you know, and nestles in with the ideal functionality seems really different to me from just application of a context as, as we see in PL. Um, so, so I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to argue that there, that that the context has been split kind of into these two different places. And when you, when you put together multiple stages transitivity wise, you know, and you see then, then the simulators are, are stacking up um, one on top of the other. And, and that's just, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like two dimensional rather than one dimensional or something that we've, we've got these two and, and, and it doesn't, the, the fact that the, the adversary and the environment are working in concert doesn't change that. It's still, it's still a more complicated kind of topology. So really, I was afraid that, so, so I think, if you play out and you're looking like maybe the virtual part of the environment is the adversary, but uh, really, as you said, the point is that the difference between the APIs, you know, and, and the side effects and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. yeah. And when we put when we put multiple levels of this together, I mean, yeah. I think I think it's useful to sort of visualize how the simulators end up nesting. Yeah. So it's you know this is fundamentally two dimensional. I mean, even the way you draw it is mm -hmm. is two dimensional, where you can kind of see a context as one dimensional. Yeah. The, the the kind of the API versus the side effects. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, it, and it feels like, I mean, if we run with this idea, I mean, well, in PL we have side effects, which are, which are not quite like this, but, you know, but, but I, I, feel, I feel like there's got to be a way of reading this that would be really useful um, in PL. I, I just don't know, I mean, I, you know, in terms of language-based security, it's, it's clearly useful, but I, I feel like it's useful more, more globally. Um, and like it's like it's different. It's it's just different from anything I'd seen before. Yeah, uh, the way I've been looking at it is, you know, how can we connect these ideas um, with a, sorry, with an end in mind? To me, the end in mind is sort of end-to-end -end security of the things that we run. You know, I want to swap. I. I, I want to encourage all of you to think about what are all of the assumptions that we make when we prove certain things, right? About uh, a protocol at a certain level. Uh, and what's the gap between that and the thing that actually runs? And how can we sort of start to formally model what those gaps are and then perhaps start to fill them? That, like, that was the angle I was sort of taking going into this. Um, I have one other big topic that I was hoping we can, we can discuss. Um, So this is this idea of, uh, you know, there are a lot of different um, languages, libraries out there uh, to make, you know, to make it easier for people to implement uh, multi-party computation um, and, you know, uh, applications and so on. Um, and I sort of split this up into two columns and I'm 
to be honest, sometimes I'm not quite sure what, what to put where. Like you can see I put obliv-c and obliv-vm in both columns. So um, languages that make it easy for easier to write crypto primitives or MPC primitives, right? And that is this column. And then there are various languages, um, you know, DSLs like Wisteria or there's ShareMind, um, you know, how that make it easier to write applications. The question I sort of wanted to open up to the floor is, you know, what is missing in this space? What is still hard? Um, what do we not know how to do? Do we need better abstractions? And if so, for what? Um, you know, what in your experience are the things that we're missing? Um, or the other thing is from, from a PL sort of perspective, we PL people keep trying to understand, you know, we, uh, like trying to design DSLs, um, perhaps languages with uh, stronger type systems so that you can, so the type checking can give you certain guarantees about uh, your, the protocol you're implementing, for instance, so, or the multi-party computation you're implementing. So Bisteria had that goal in mind. Then there's this with star work, which has an even stronger dependent type system where you can verify everything you're writing. So what, what are the sweet spots? What could we design? Um, what are the guarantees or assurances we're looking for from lightweight to heavier? So I'll, I'll just, this kind of touches on the resource estimation part I was talking about earlier, that I'm going to write a program and I want it to do the fastest crypto thing that's secure, whatever, or most resource efficient, whatever that means. And I don't know how to link between, oh yeah, we've designed all these special purpose things, these are the guarantees that they provide for this. Are they compatible, right? I don't know how to performance do guarantees. I don't have resource. performance or security guarantees when I'm switching between primitives. Okay. Uh, switching between primitives, not composing primitives. Both. Both. Yeah. You need specs for that, and then you need these things to be composable. <laughs> yeah. Maybe what you when you write a, a, a compiler uh, for one language to another, uh, somehow, and you want to write, you know, what is the kind of the ideal functionality of this compiler uh, that it would uh, preserve uh, correctness, obviously, and uh, and then it would also do something with respect to side channel leakage, you know, in terms of uh, uh, I have guarantees. Uh, uh, that if the code has some specific high-level language uh, protection, I'll be able to implement them correctly in uh, uh, in, uh, in in the low-level language. And but then it will have to kind of depend on whatever guarantees that the hardware is giving, you know, to, uh, to the low-level language. Itself. But somehow one has to build this all the way up from the hardware. Maybe you want to start from the hardware. This is the guarantees that I'm giving, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, with respect to side channel attacks, with respect to cache attacks, and whatever in terms of timing. Uh, and maybe there is, uh, you know, there's this, all this discussion today about reopening the hardware software contract. So maybe one can actually add to this contract uh, uh, some some bits that the program can tell the, the hardware, you know, am I, you know, do I want to be secure? Do I not want to be secure? Should you do cache optimizations or not? Or can you, you know, and then pay maybe for performance and then give some guarantees that, that you know, part of the contract would be the, uh, the what leakage I'm giving. And this will you know, prop propagate all the way up. And then anyway, that will be one way to do it. So even there, I feel like there are two ways people have looked at this. One is to sort of say, you know, in the PL community, uh, like how do we give a high level language a cost semantics? You know, um, how does some idealized kind of cost semantics at the high level map to, you know, more precise uh, costs at the low level, but in a, in a uniform way, right? In a faithful sort of way. Um, then there's this other idea. I, I don't know if uh, fiat crypto is quite the perfect thing to point at for this, but um, fiat crypto is this, uh, Adam Chappelle has been working on this, right? Uh, write down specs and then generate performance Im uh, performant implementations, the most performant that you can, which of course then requires some sort of a specification at the hardware level or at, the, at a lower level, like, you know, what sort of performance guarantees are we getting? Like, what are the resource costs at the lower level? Yes, also leakage costs, exactly, yes, 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 yes. Leakage guarantees, especially then we need to know from the hardware like what's happening, but yeah, yeah. So if we think about what, if we think about the, the what the environment does at different levels, then 
then it might be that at a higher level, there are like more abstract values that are flowing back and forth between the environment and, and a real or ideal functionality. Um, the adversary, though, at a lower level might be seeing things that don't even make sense at a higher level of abstraction. So um, they might be seeing, um, I don't know, uh, cash behavior or you know some kind of low-level stuff that is a side effect of the, um, the the functionalities running. That at at a higher level, how do you make sense of these things? I mean, I and have. You want to hide it from yeah, the programmer, I Yeah, think. I mean, I have. I don't think it, it quite makes sense to think at at the highest level you've got these pure programming notations and trying to imagine all of the, the mischief that can happen at a lower level, you don't want to do it there. But if we're thinking about moving from a UC theorem at a high level to eventually a UC theorem at the low level where there's all this more stuff that can happen, um, it seems like maybe you, you need to do some extra work at those lower levels to convince yourself that you know, the, I mean, you can't, you don't want to say the adversary has exactly the same discriminating power down there. You want to, you want to say, well, we need to think about adversaries that are more, more able to see all the stuff that's going on. And, and so there's going to be something going on in that path that, that we'll have to do. I mean, we'll have to actually do those proofs. Sorry. So when you say that, are you, um, Talking about the um, the adversary seeing properties of the actual compiled code uh, that are only evident at the low level, or are you talking about the adversary being able to control the machine hardware at that lower level? Because I think if like um, uh, timing properties and so on, uh, those could be mitigated at the at the compiler level by the compiler providing guarantees saying I will do everything I can to reduce the possibility of uh, timing uh, uh, you know different paths through this same functionality having different times for cases where you explicitly ask for it uh, but uh, there are if, if hmm. the, the problem of the adversary having low-level control of the hardware not necessarily in its interaction with your code but in its interaction with other things that's a lot harder to say. Yeah, I think the second problem is just e even more hard, that there are more things, so if the adversary can corrupt certain things, um, then there are more things that might be corruptible at, at a lower level. Um, but even if we just think about it being able to observe the sort of side effects, um, then yeah, we have to find a way to mitigate that. And I mean, one way is, is that as we compile to lower and lower levels that we somehow shield things or do it, you know, in constant time or, you know, whatever, so that so that even when more things are exposed at the lower level, it doesn't help the adversary, that it, it can't manage to see anything new. Um, something like that. I mean, I guess we, we had in discussions uh, at, in the back of the room earlier today um, you, at a higher level, you might have um, an authenticated channel. At a lower level, you might actually need to use like signatures and things to, you know, and some crypto to make something work that at a higher level you just had for free. And, and so, I mean, as we go down the stack, um, then how things are enforced may change. I don't know. So. If, if there's something at the lower level that you're considering shielding or, or making uh, the making it so the programmer doesn't have to be aware of that, that's really another way of saying, I want my compiling tool chain to provide guarantees of right. that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I mean, it, and, and, and one, so one aspect of that is how the compiler works, but then as we take abstract facilities and turn them into concrete realizations, then, then we may need to use different enforcement mechanisms that at, a, at an abstract level, we might just have something in the programming language that, that we know works, right? That it's abstract, and when we realize that with nuts and bolts at a lower level, then maybe we have to introduce 
um, some crypto to convince ourselves that, you know, to be able to prove that it still works, that it, it hasn't broken at that level? I know. Compilations, though they're, you know, it's not crypto, it's not UC preservation, it's sort of a uh, equivalence preservation in the presence of all contexts kind of property. Um, so there are sort of two camps. Um, you can, you know, uh, a lot of my work has been about how do you compile down to lower and lower levels. Um, in a sense, taking a high-level spec, I do it using types, but essentially some sort of specification of the program. But then as you compile lower and lower down, you say you want to tighten that spec in a sense. So the specification to me is saying, what context am I allowed to link with? What attackers am I allowed to link with? Um, so you somehow want to rule out linking with context that would behave badly. Another thing you could do is you could wrap your code or you know, uh, your protocol in this, in this case with um, some sort of dynamic checks. And that would be you know, using some sort of crypto, perhaps, to protect it from, from the additional attacks that are now possible at a lower level that never could have ar arisen at the high level. So, so, this, so how would you do uh, in, 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 in this language? How would you specify the compiler protects against the uh, attack? Because even if the performance is of the step of attack, mm -hmm. the, the, the you know the result of code is not. So how would you specify? We don't we don't know how to do timing yet, right? We like yeah. haven't even tried it. It's right. uh, too yeah. So I don't think the, 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 this kind of like a deal a deal way is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You could do this if you're. Yeah, you could do this if you could spec somehow um, ask that you're the adversary that you're going to link with satisfy a certain specification. The specification is very precise about uh, timing somehow uh, about what timing behavior that that adversary is is that context you're linking with is allowed to observe. That's a very low level <laughs> difficult spec, but yes, that that, uh, that general idea, yeah. I mean, the, the notion of program behavior can certainly include timing behavior, and that just makes what the kind of thing that Amal was showing us harder, that, that you, you know, if you have two operation, contextually equivalent programs at a, at a high level and then at the low level, um, at, the, at a high level where timing, you know, whatever behavior doesn't mean anything, maybe. And then at, at a high level, let's say you assume, given your language model, that timing is not observable, but now yeah, at the yeah, level it is. Yeah, that's so right. And, and so, observable. so that means that the compiler somehow is going to have to deal with that, which is kind of uh, what Patrick's point was. And I, you know, I, th I think that's, that's not something where, that's not a, a fundamental point of difference between um, this PL kind of style contextual um, development and and real ideal. I, I I think. I mean, I think it's an issue in both. You could model it with real ideal, right? Yes. I mean, it, it also comes up in real ideal, but but there's some some things just seem seem like they're points of difference, and some of them are points of commonality. This seems like a point of commonality. Um, so the the split between the ideal functionality and the simulator, you know, and the asymmetry. Um, that's there. It seems like like something that's different, but other things seem like they're similar to me. Abby, do you want to say something about Oblivc? <laughs> or oh yeah, <laughs> we have a couple minutes. Okay. Um, anyone else want to add anything? No. Okay, then thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this entire two-day two -day workshop. And let's give them a hand. <laughs>